So, I am personally very thrilled um, to introduce our closing speaker for the effort, for the morning after we're now afternoon. Robin Hamlin from Kingston, Ontario, and her dad drove down this morning just to be here with you to spend this time um, talking about these vital issues. Robin was 13 years old, probably exactly the same as many of you, when she learned in school some of the dire things that you've been hearing about, about the condition of water on our planet. When she got home that afternoon, this is the way I understand the story and the way I tell the story, um, she was so moved, so upset, so concerned about this vital issue that she just beseeched her mother, we have to do something. As I recall the story, Mom was very busy, very distracted, didn't have a lot of time that particular day, and uh, suggested, well, well, maybe you should call the, neighbor, the mayor and see if you can go in and talk to him, get some, some action on it locally. Robin did some research first, it was a good plan, learned of an organization called the Council of Canadians and their project called the Blue Community. That's as far as I'm going to go because I'm going to let her finish the story, where she has taken that in the past three years, uh, and the impact that she, as a, as a lone individual, has been having in this province, our very province of Ontario. So um, she's got, she's got uh, a great presentation, a great talk uh, to, to share with you, and we've also allowed time at the end for you to be able to ask her your questions directly. And so when that time comes, we've got people on the side of the auditorium, and we've got someone upstairs in the balcony with microphones, so that we can all hear your question. And, um, and she looks forward to those dialogues, because uh, it tells her that you've been paying attention and that you care as well. So, please jo join me in welcoming to the stage, Robin Hamlin. Coming 
polluted. And it's getting overpumped, slowly but surely, taking away more and more water that we can use. If we don't do something, the water running through the cycle is going to become so polluted that we won't be able to use any of it. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we are running out of water. Our Earth is called the Blue Planet. When you see it from space, you see water. But 97% of that water is salt water. Only 3% of it is fresh. That 3% is almost all polluted. You may not see it, you may not hear about it, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening. Nearly 1.6 billion people around the world live in severe conditions where water is either so polluted and filled with chemicals that they can't drink it, or there is barely any water at all. So how did it come, become so polluted? Unfortunately, there are many reasons. We use chemicals to increase farming productivity, to meet the growing demand for our population. We then have emissions that rise from the chemicals or it rides from the vehicles that we use excessively. We have industrial plants that are used to create all of our stuff that also add to the pollutants in our air and water. Over 60% of the wetlands that can be used to help clean our water, the solution has been destroyed in the past 100 years. 60%, that is more than half of our wetlands, are gone. We're also depleting our source of water. Just around the Great Lakes, you can see right there, we pump almost 3.2 trillion liters of water a day. 7.4 billion liters do not get returned. We use so much more water than we actually need. Now I want to tell you guys a story. A story about the Aral Sea. The Aral Sea near Kazakhstan, which is in the Middle East, was one of the four largest lakes in the entire world. It was so big they called it a sea. <clears throat> but in the 1960s, the rivers that fed this huge, huge lake slash ocean were taken over by Soviet irrigation projects. And after that, the Aral Sea began to shrink. And shrink. And shrink. Until it became this. This is the Aral Sea in the beginning. This is a picture of the Aral Sea in 2002. Now, I don't have a recent picture of the Aral Sea. So I'm going to let you guys imagine what it's like now in 2015. Remember that when you drain a lake, that's it. It's gone. If we don't do something, this could be what happens to our Great Lakes. The largest group of freshwater lakes in the world, which provide more than 20% of the world's surface freshwater, and provide life to more than 40 million people, including all of you here today. They are in trouble, and we need to do something before they end up like the um, Aral Sea, which is, and I quote, one of the planet's worst environmental disasters. <laughs> we have resorted to pumping nearly 30 billion gallons of water a day to provide for our needs. Almost everywhere you look, you see either water, something that requires water, or something that was made through the help of water. How many of you guys have a car? Or, well, your family has a car. <laughs> That's all of you, right? Now, how many of you have more than one car for your family? That's more than half. Now, I hope you guys really like your cars. Because if you want to make one of those, you need 350,000 liters of water. If you want to make one microchip, you're going to need 32 liters of water. And finally, if you want to make one liter of bottled water, you need three to five liters of water. Now, unfortunately,
unfortunately, we don't know how much groundwater we're sitting on. But we do know that we are pumping up to 15 times more groundwater than what's being returned back into it. There was an ancient city in the Middle East called Dubar that had disappeared underneath the desert sands. No one knew why until archaeologists discovered that the reason it had disappeared into the ground was because of groundwater pumping. Because you see, groundwater isn't just a source of fresh water. It supports the land on top of it. So when you go and you excessively pump out all of the water, the ground on top collapses. And not only is this happening in Ubar, it's happening all around the world. This is a picture of Winter Park, Florida. Giant sinkholes <coughs> like this are emerging because of groundwater, uh, groundwater pumping. We also can take a look at the regions of San Joaquin Valley, California, and Mexico City. And because of groundwater pumping, the land is starting to tilt. And over here, you can see the land is starting to descend. Now, the only question is, how long is it going to take before it either collapses or it descends to the point where there is no more water underneath it? Now, I want to talk a little about soil erosion. <coughs> Deforestation, overgrazing, winds and flooding, are damaging the top layer of our soil. The soil is hardened, making it more difficult for rainwater to soak into it. We are now seeing areas of our earth turn into desert because of this. All of this that I just told you is our water crisis. Now there are people around the world who look at the water crisis and they don't see a problem, they see a solution which in a way you think is good, but the solution isn't. <laughs> they, they want to turn our attention to ocean water. Oh, oops, wrong button. There we go, ocean water. They want to turn our attention to ocean water because these people want us to think of the solution for our water crisis as desalinization. Desalinization is the process where the salt and minerals in the salt water is removed, making it fresh water. Now, considering we have so much ocean water and so little fresh water, this seems like a great idea, but it's not. Desalinization requires huge amounts of fossil fuels, and I don't need to tell you guys, because I know you've gone over it in your classrooms, that we only have a limited amount of fossil fuels, and that those fossil fuels are damaging our environment, leading to global warming, which is causing climate change. Financially, if you want to build a desalinization plant, you're going to need a lot of money, like a lot. The only, um, if we think of desalinization as a solution, it would only be the solution for the richer countries because those are the only people that would be able to afford it. The other countries wouldn't even be able to consider desalinization. Now, all of this information is very upsetting. And you'd hope that we would be taking steps forward into fixing all of these problems so that everyone on the planet can have water for the future. But unfortunately, the powerful people of the world see the water crisis, and they see an opportunity to get a hold of what's left and make a profit out of it. They don't see water, they see money. When, in 1992, at a UN conference in Dublin, Ireland, we saw for the first time that water was looked at as an economic good, not a human right. There are 87 corporations that see where the future is and are investing in building desalinization plants so that in the future, when all of us are looking for water, guess where we're going to have to get it from? These corporations. And buying water will no longer be an option, but the only way to get it. If you listen to people talk about how they achieve their dreams, it usually started out with a form of inspiration. My ins 
inspiration was in grade seven when I saw the movie Blue Gold World Waterworks. Now I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I used to hate sitting where you're sitting. I hated listening to environmental lectures and I hated listening to the documentaries because it upset me. I avoided it at any cost. It was sad to listen to and I would feel horrible afterwards because what are we supposed to do? The ice caps are melting. We can't do anything. But in 2011, my teacher, unannounced, or, um, out of nowhere, came out and showed us the video of Blue Gold. So I had no choice but to sit and watch it. Now I'm going to show you guys a bit of a trailer, just so you can get the idea of what the movie's like. One thing that most people don't know is that the world is desertifying very quickly. We are becoming a desert, and there's nowhere to go in the world to get away from us. They've already mapped out what are going to be the most intense areas of potential conflict. People think that water privatization is just a problem in the developing world, but we have the very same situation in the U.S. When the water system doesn't work, then the civilization goes. They handed power over to big water companies who want to create a kind of water cartel so that one day every single drop of fresh water in the world will be privately owned and controlled. These corporations aren't accountable to the communities that they serve. They're accountable to their shareholders. I think Wall Street understands this is the commodity to be invested in. This has become the most precious thing on earth. The water is a supply and demand commodity. The question is how to get it from source to market. So here's one of the driest continents on earth being told by the World Bank to export its water to get its way out of debt. In the form of roses that are sold in Europe. Controlling water is everything. The army is brought in to control local dissent. Who are you protecting? There's your people without drinking water and you're protecting foreign investors. Bottom line, uh, water is an investment period. We need the political will, and that political will is not going to come from the top, it's going to come from the bottom up. The leaders in our movement are coming from the grassroots. And I'm talking Republicans, Democrats. Whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. We're fighting. But we're fighting for the people that are going to use it in the future, our kids and their kids. If we don't do something to save it, what are they going to have? We are not talking about potential tension. We are talking about blood being spilled on the streets. If money is more important than water, where are we? Wherever a river is now treated as a supplier of raw material as if it was born, serious people have serious enemies. We have the generation of water wars. Water. Because the last thing I wanted to do 
do is go into the mayor's office, have him pat me on the back and say, everything's fine, it's gonna be okay. I wanted to make a change. So Sam Matzo got back to me and he connected me with Maude Barlow. Any of you know who Maude Barlow is? I have only got one person. All right, um, Maude Barlow, pretty amazing woman. Um, she actually starred in the movie. I don't know if you recognize her from the um, trailer I just saw, but she um, starred in the movie Blue Gold. She's a famous Canadian activist who's the national chairperson of the Council of Canadians. And she told me that if I wanted to do something, I should ask my mayor to make Kingston a blue community. A blue community treats water as belonging to no one and is the responsibility of all. It must be governed by principles that allow for reasonable use, equal distribution, and reasonable treatment in order to preserve water for nature and future generations like you and me. Now, if you want to become blue, then you have to take three steps, or the city has to pass at least three laws. The first one is banning the sale of bottled water at public facilities and at municipal events, which means bottled water is not allowed to be sold in any public facility, any library, any local hockey rink, and it's not allowed to be sold at any public events like parades. Now, before I go any further, I want to ask all of you guys, who here has ever drank bottled water? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know what? I got really mad at all of you, but I'm kind of raising my hand, too. I know what you're thinking, the crazy water girl up there drank bottled water? Yeah, I did. I actually kind of liked it. I had like my own little spa in my room with a big box. And, yeah, like a little personal mini fridge. It was actually really cool. Um, anyways, I did drink that bottled water. And that was before I knew all the facts about it, though. Because I didn't see any problems. But that was until I learned that it takes three to five liters of water to make one liter of bottled water. And that was before I knew that bottled water companies require massive amounts of fossil fuels to manufacture and to transport this, their bottled water, which contributes, again, to climate change. That was before I read that the production of water bottles uses 17 million barrels of oil a year. And that was before I knew that bottled water is unnecessary. I know, I actually have to be told that it's unnecessary. You can actually go to your tab and fill up your own glass. If you think about it, the whole idea of bottled water is kind of ridiculous. I mean, it's environmentally destructive and it's unnecessary. In fact, when bottled water was first um, introduced, people laughed at it. Water is free, people said. What are they going to sell us next? Air? So how did they get people hooked onto buying bottled water? Everybody drank tap water. They didn't need bottled water, so why would they go out and pay so much more for something they already have? The bottled water companies came in, and they made people feel scared and insecure if they didn't buy bottled water. They put up ads saying that their water is safer. But this isn't true. Bottled water is regulated as a food product under the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which basically means that bottled water like a what bottled water like plants, I don't even think I said it right there, um, are only um, expected to inspect their um, facilities once every three years. Now municipal tap water is tested continuously, both during and after treatment. Now, the second step they took was misleading us. Bottled water companies are always bragging about how environmentally friendly they are. When actually it's just a cover up, they're wasting huge amounts of oil to produce their product, even more to transport it, and then we can drink it in less than five minutes. Now, let's not forget what happens at the end of the cycle. I read an article from the Toronto Sun that said as few as, fit, as less, less than 50% of water bottles that Torontonians consume every day are actually being recycled. Now this means as many as 65 million empty plastic water bottles per year end up as garbage in a landfill waste site. And that's just Toronto. Can you imagine how much all of Canada throws away? Bottled water is a convenience, but we are at the point where our earth can no longer support convenience.
convenience, we have to go back to the time before bottled water even existed. The second resolution is recognizing water as a human right. This is pretty simple. It means that no one should go out without water. Everyone should have access to clean, fresh water, and no one should go thirsty because they don't have water to drink. The third and last resolution to becoming a blue community is promoting publicly owned and operated water and wastewater services. When water and sanitation services, the people that clean your water, when they're owned by a private company, they usually cut the workforce, they increase the price to the customer, and they cut corners in protecting the environment. Now I brought all of this up to my mayor, and he invited me to, um, to speak at City Council on September 20th. And on September 20th, after I, they had explained to me how the whole council thing works, it's really complicated. Um, but after they explained it to me, I realized that Kingston had just become a blue community. So I was pretty happy. <laughs> Just go really fast when you shampoo. 
What about low flow shower heads and toilets? This limits the amount of water being used in your home or apartment every single day. The average person in Africa uses less water each day than what we use to flush our toilets. Your toilet uses about eight liters on average. The average person in Africa has, less, has access to less than five liters of water today. And I can guarantee you, your uh, toilet water is probably cleaner than theirs. So, that's not saying something I don't know what is. If you turn your tap off, you save one gallon of water per minute. If you got a rain barrel, you can save... Ah, I forgot to put on how much it saves. You can save a lot of water if you get a rain barrel. <laughs> now, it does cost $42. But if $42 means more water for future generations, it's a pretty good investment. And a rain barrel is basically just a barrel you get to put next to your house, and when it rains, it collects the rainwater, which you can then use to water your garden and your lawn. And that way you don't have to pump water from the, um, wherever you get your water from the city. Like the really big buildings with like the water in it, whatever those are called. <laughs> now, the last tip will probably be the easiest one. And that's making a personal commitment to use your own refillable water bottles instead of bottled water. Just think about it. Why would you pay 200 to 3,000 times more for a bottle of water than your tap water, which is 0 .0003 cents? That would be like paying $10,000 for a sandwich. Now, I know these things that I've just said, these tips, are things that people think are so small that they don't even matter. But if everyone contributes their single drop into the bucket, eventually that bucket will overflow. So I want to try something. Are you guys willing to make a change? Yeah. Whoa, 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 who said no? I don't know who it is. I'll, I'll find you. Okay. <laughs> Four minutes. 